Hi guys, and welcome to Preliminary Chemistry, topic number th three, water, and this is video number four, and we're going to have a little bit of a look at Lewis structures in this video. Lewis structures are ways of drawing or representing the electron configuration around um, different atoms as they bond, particularly as they bond um, in a covalent kind of a way. We have looked at Lewis structures for both ionic and covalent substances, um, but we're going to be focusing, particularly because we're setting this in the context of water, with uh, a look specifically at Lewis structures as they relate to covalent um, compounds. So what we're going to do is look at the way that non-metallic elements interact with one another and form covalent bonds through the sharing of electrons. And the purpose of that is to, in, in order to achieve a stable octet, eight electrons in the outer shell. And that's, that's pretty much the goal when we're looking at this. Chemistry being chemistry has plenty of exceptions, but that's what we're going to try and focus on in this particular video. So the first one that you can see here is hydrogen, which has just a single, just one outer shell electron. Fluorine, on the other hand, has seven outer shell electrons and therefore it's lacking one here because hydrogen's in the first period it only has two electrons in its outer shell so it needs one here because both of these are wishing to gain the easiest way for them to deal with this is to just share them and this shared structure creates a covalent bond and we can represent that covalent bond, as you can see over here. But the important thing about Lewis structures and the reason they're going to be useful to us in this topic is that they also allow us to identify any non-bonded electrons, or in this case, non-bonded pairs. It would be true to say that around the average atom, particularly when that atom has been bonded, you would have eight electrons distributed as four pairs in a tetrahedral arrangement. Now, that tetrahedral arrangement disappears to a certain extent when only one of those pairs is actually a bonded pair. So in this case, this would be the bonded pair of electrons. And fluorine, so hydrogen, has only one bonded pair and no around here, zero, zero, zero. There are no unbonded electrons around the hydrogen atom, but there are three non-bonded pairs around the fluorine atom. And this is important when we look at things like density, like melting points and boiling points, the structure, the crystal structure in the solid state, and the amount of energy that's required in order to separate the molecules from one another, because they give us an idea of the interactions between these different uh, molecules. The shape of the molecule is affected by the number of bonds that are formed and that means that we can start to classify different types of compounds on the basis of the shape. So the first of these is the water molecule and that's the one that we're most familiar with and it's the, the one that's really I guess set the context for this particular type of um, discussion and that's because oxygen has a tetrahedral, a tetrahedral arrangement of four pairs of electrons around the atom. But two of those pairs are unbonded, two unbonded pairs and two covalently bonded pairs. The consequence of that, of course, is that we have this polarity, this slight positive and slight negative region of the molecule that splits that up into a dipole and uh, interacts with other molecules as a dipole-dipole interaction. What it does mean though is when we look at this molecule we can't sort of see where those unbonded pairs of electrons are so we only see the shape which is a shape that looks like this which is a bent shape and so that's what this idea of bent is. The interaction between the hydrogens and which is a slightly positive region in the molecule and the oxygens from adjacent uh, molecules 
links these together in the type of bonding which we refer to as hydrogen bonding, which is a special type of dipole-dipole um, interaction. Ammonia, on the other hand, whilst it too has uh, eight electrons around the central atom, which in this case is a nitrogen, only one of those, one unbonded pair, only one of those is an unbonded pair. However, when we look at this particular structure, what we find is that the nitrogen is in a slightly different plane to the hydrogens. And so we end up with this trigonal pyramid kind of arrangement. So above is where we would find the top of the tetrahedron, which is where you would get that link to another atom, for example. So that trigonal pyramid arrangement is what we find for ammonia, where nitrogen bonds with three hydrogens. Hydrogen sulfide is, sulfur is in the same group as oxygen and therefore will bond in the same way. And so it too will create a bent molecule. Notice some of the differences in melting and boiling point as a consequence of these different types of bonding. Melting and boiling points are often a consequence of two main things. Number one, the strength of the bonds within the molecules, the strength of the bonds between the molecules, and also the size of the molecules. Because melting and boiling points are about moving molecules apart from one another, very big molecules held together by very strong covalent bonds are very hard to get moving, and therefore they require a lot more energy and will have higher melting and boiling points. Very small molecules, that are able to be moved more easily, um, that are not held, maybe held with strong bonds within the molecule, but weaker bonds between the molecules require very little energy for them to be separated. And on this basis, we explain some of the observations that we see around melting and boiling points. The bonding between atoms and between molecules affects the structure of the crystal and its melting and boiling points. So, if we were to look at four elements in a row, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, all of these are in the same period, period two, in the periodic table. If we bonded each of those with hydrogen, what sort of structures would we get? And could you relate the differences in the melting and boiling points to these structures? Well, the simplest one to start with is the carbon. So we would draw carbon with all of the electrons being bonded pairs. This forms a tetrahedron. And it's not easy to see in uh, a two-dimensional drawing like this, uh, unless you sort of try and show some of these coming into the page and out of the page. Um, but it's much easier if you use the model kits and we'll have a look at some of these structures with the model kits and you'll actually see this tetrahedral arrangement. The ammonia, the NH3, was we drew on the previous slide, it has two unbonded electrons, or one pair of unbonded electrons, and it has a trigonal pyramid. We will look at an alternative to the trigonal pyramid, which is trigonal planar, when there is a central atom linked to three other atoms, but when they're all on the same plane, then it's trigonal planar. But when one of those atoms is sitting in the plane above the other three, then it's a pyramid. Water we know has a bent structure and it has two unbonded pairs of electrons. And hydrogen fluoride, I'll just draw that in as a bond, has three unbonded pairs of electrons and it is what we call linear. So these are the names that we give to the different structures of each of these types of um, molecules. And then we look at the way that they're packed together in order to uh, understand something about the crystal structure, and the melting and boiling points. And we'll have a look, bit of a look at these in a little bit more detail in the next video. Thanks for watching.